students, welcome to the lecture for this week. Um, basically, I don't know if you guys actually saw the syllabus or if just your parents saw it, but the title for this week is called uh, Wars in Revival. Um, and that's basically because um, as we look at the early part of the 18th century, I, I mean, technically the first um, we'll call it the first 63 years since the French and Indian War ended in, uh, in 63. Um, there are kind of three things um, that I think are, are the most significant um, developments insofar as it relates to American history. Um, those are, well, t two main ones and then one kind of, kind of sidebar that would come into play, I think, in greater significance than most um, people give it credit for. Um, but the two main ones are the First Great Awakening, um, at the time the only Great Awakening, um, but we now know it as the First Great Awakening, and then secondly the French and Indian War. Um, and, and then the third kind of s sidebar, but w what I'll talk about for a little bit, um, is what we call uh, King George's War, although in Europe I believe we call it the War of Offscreen Succession. Um, I'm not positive about that, but uh, I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. Um, so we're going to talk about those three things. Obviously, um, those aren't the only three things that happened in the first 60 years. Um, a couple of things that if you are, um, if you're interested that, that were definitely significant. Um, one of them was the Negro Conspiracy of 1741. Um, that's worth researching. Um, I'm not going to go into it a lot here just because it the, the significance of it is very theoretical um, and not actual. It, it was basically just a, um, a plot that was um, by some black slaves and I think one free black um, that was found out and, and dealt with in an absolutely horrific manner in which they, they burned a lot of the conspirators alive. Um, and so it was, it was just a fascinating uh, story and had a lot to uh, be significant and that it is a precursor to the absolutely unnecessarily terrible relations that whites and blacks would have throughout uh, American history. So in that way it's uh, it's very it's very interesting. And then another very significant um, event that we're not going to go into too much detail here but that I would encourage you to research on your own um, was in 1735. Um, Peter, Z Peter Zanger, I think is how you say his name, um, was acquitted of seditious libel, um, which was most historians considered to be the most significant event that established the freedom of the press, um, which would, of course, find its way into our Constitution and has been a monumental achievement um, and an extremely important development in America. Sure, we're not going to go too much into it just because that's an aspect of, of American history that I'm not too familiar with and I don't want to uh, lead you guys astray. But again, if it's something that you want to uh, research on your own, um, I would encourage you to do that because it is very interesting and either one of those might spark you to want to discover more or make that a focus point or you know whatever you want to do. Um, and uh, I, there's other things. There's Queen Anne's War in, in the early 1700s. Um, I actually didn't know this, but apparently Benjamin, Fr here, I found somewhere, let me see if I can find it real quick in my notes. Oh, Benjamin Franklin demonstrates that lightning is form of electricity by flying a kite in a key during a thunderstorm. I vaguely remember that Benjamin Franklin flew a kite and that was significant somehow. But again, that's one of those facts that are like, I mean, great. <laughs> I don't know why that's important. <laughs> Apparently, I was reading, and it's all in history textbooks all over the place. I don't, never needed to know that. And getting a history degree never was significant. Doesn't really mean anything. Um, but anyway, if you guys are all scientists and want to learn more about that, you should. Uh, you should feel free to do so. Um, when it comes to the Great Awakening, that's going to be what your reading assignment is going to be for this week, so I'm not actually going to talk um, about that very much um, in this lecture. 
um, I'll post the reading assignment. The reading assignment is going to be a little bit different this week um, in that it's not going to be from a uh, historian, famous historian. Um, it's actually an essay that a friend of mine, um, we got our history degrees at UCF at the same time, he wrote for one of his classes. And so I'm assigning that because instead of by an actual you know, PhD historian, um, because I think it gives a better idea of the type of writing um, that I'm, that I expect out of you guys. Um, and that, not that my friend is not a good writer, he's actually an excellent writer, but it was an assignment that he was turning in to a professor. It wasn't something that he was writing to get published. It wasn't something that he was writing because, you know, he had accumulated so much knowledge about it over the course of decades of study that he was qualified to then write a journal article or a book about it, you know. Um, it was an assignment and he did the research and he wrote the essay and, and, and did a great job. Um, and that's of course what, what you guys will be doing. Um, and so it gives you more of an idea of what I'm looking for. And so because he wrote this about this topic, because we're covering this topic, I figured it was a good opportunity um, to make that the reading assignment instead of something by a, by a PhD that most of us don't understand half of anyway. Um, and so that's what the reading assignment is. And because he covers um, that topic of the Great Awakening, the First Great Awakening, uh, I'm not going to cover it too much in this lecture. Um, so anyways, I'm going to start with uh, King George's War, since that's kind of the quickest thing. And I'm not going to go into the details. You can look it up and um, actually, in both King George's War and for the French and Indian War, um, to find details about it, which again, like I always say, I'm not, I'm not interested in details. I don't think details are the most important thing about studying history. Um, but if you, but if they're, but if they're important for you to have a context of what's going on, um, both of those subjects, King George's War and the French and Indian War. The Wikipedia articles were were written um, uh, by history students, um, and so by prospective PhD history students. So they're not historians academically yet, but they're on their way. Both of those are very good, um, and so to learn more facts and details, you can you can trust the Wikipedia articles on these two topics. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into uh, the specific details of King George's War, um, except to, to basically say that it was a war. It, it's called that in um, the United States now. Um, in Europe, it's known as the War of Austrian Succession. Um, the death of the Emperor of Austria um, is what kind of started it. Um, there's a there's a lot. Of, I mean, this is European history. You don't really need to know this. There were a lot of other claimants, but basically. It embroiled nearly all of the nations of Europe because of all the different claims and, you know, all the fighting that ensued from there. Um, it's not not a lot of the um, fighting or anything occurred in America. The reason why it's important is really um, for only one reason, which is the fort at Louisbourg, which was owned by the French. Um, Again, the details of how the fort was conquered and taken over aren't important, but suffice it to say that the, that the British, um, which by Amer I mean, American colonists, but at the time, obviously, the colony of Britain, they're the British, um, but American colonists um, representing the British began an expedition against um, Louisbourg and ended up taking it, and it was... A huge deal. I mean, that fort was the crown jewel of of French um, land possession in the New World, and uh, and the French really did think that it was that it was secure, that it was impenetrable. It was it was it was their their baby in the New World, and so they were shocked and they were horrified um, when it was taken, um, and they tried to recap. I mean, they, they and they were shocked when it was retaken, and they made a huge effort uh, to get it back. Um, the French king sent someone to try to take it back. He died. His successor committed suicide. 
They sent another fleet. It was captured. I mean, it was he made a lot of effort. It was rebuffed. We had taken their fort. Um, and the colonists, who at that time were, I mean, revolution was a long ways away. I mean, this is, I think this is 1743 or 44, maybe. Um, so, I mean, we're talking, I mean, if it, let's assume for a second it was 44. I'll just say, I don't really know. But let's assume it's 44 for the sake of the argument. Um, I mean, we're talking 30 years before revolution would start and, and a good 15 to 20 years before revolution was even a remote possibility. Um, so we're talking long before that, and thus we're talking that we're talking about British citizens. I mean, they, the concepts of independence and the concept of being American colonists wasn't even fully formed. Um, and so as British citizens, we've, as British citizens, but as colonists, we've done something significant. You know, that was the feeling. We've contributed to winning this war. And what happens is that the peace treaty between um, the, the Anglo-Franco peace treaty between the English and the French um, is a range that basically restores everything. Um, it restored to each power what it had possessed before the war, is how one person said it. It restored to each power what it had possessed before the war, which meant that Louisbourg had to be restored to the French. So we take this fort, we take this fort, colonists, we take this fort for the British. We help them in this war. We're going to win this war together. You guys over there in Europe, us here in America, we're winning this war. And what happens is the one thing that we do, it never happened. All those people that died, all the colonists that, you know, fought, all, everything that went into taking the fort was for nothing. That event, I would submit, was the first spark. It was the first spark in the separation between thinking, uh, in the separation in colonists thinking of themselves as something separate than British citizens. And it would be remembered. Because then later, when a lot of these shenanigans are going on before the Revolutionary War, people would remember Louisburg. And one person, um, in my notes here, uh, William Elson, that was his name. He, uh, Henry William Elson, he, he wrote a history book a long time ago. Um, he basically said that a wave of indignation swept over the English colonies when they learned that the fruit of their great victory had been quietly handed back without their knowledge or consent to the enemy from whom it had been taken. And here we find one of the many causes that led the colonists in later years to determine that American affairs must be managed in America and not by a corps of diplomats 3,000 miles across the sea who had little interest in the welfare and future of their kindred in the New World. So basically, this is one of the first things that we see where American colonists, as Elson was saying, realize that, wait a minute, what are we doing here? They, they don't know what's going on here. They, they didn't see all these people die to take this war. They didn't see all these people sacrifice and plan and all the, everything that went into it. They're 3,000 miles away. They're diplomats. And all of a sudden, they're deciding that everything that we did was for naught. That doesn't make any sense. Why are we letting... I mean, that's the, that's the line of thinking that would go in, and it would be one of the first times that you would see that. And so in that way, if we're talking about a spark... Um, I think that King George's War in that way was extremely significant um, to American history, even though the, the, the war itself was not. But this particular aspect of it in Louis, Louisburg, Louisburg um, I think was extremely significant. And if it comes up, here's where I would take notes. One of the exams on the, sorry, one of the questions on the exam for the midterm could potentially be something to the effect of, um, basically I'll be asking you to talk and discuss the buildup to the American Revolution. If I do that, um, you, should, you should mention Louisburg. I'll just put it that way. Um, and it should probably be you know, one of the first things that you mention. Um, if you want to be smart and clever and go back to Plymouth or something, 
that's fine, uh, actually, and, and there's some merit to that, and maybe you should. Um, but as far as actual sparks of the war, um, you should mention labor, and in that way, I think that it's significant. Um, before we get to French and Indian War, which is what this lecture is mostly about, um, the only thing that I will note about, you'll read, like I said, you'll read about the First Great Awakening um, from the assigned reading. The main thing, um, the only thing really that I'll say about the First Great Awakening, just to make sure that it is clear from what you read, um, that this point is clear. Um, so I'll reiterate it, although it's made in the reading as well. The First Great Awakening is not significant because tons of people became saved. It's not, you know, that that's important and glory to God for all those things. But um, it's significant because the salvation, it taught people how personal salvation is. Um, and I, I think that I think that that sort of speaks for itself. People realize when salvation, when when sin becomes personal, when salvation becomes personal, um, in the same way that the Reformation did, as far as making things, making it a personal thing, um, this would impact people. It would it it was the America is very unique in world history, and has been from the beginning and that there is an incredibly strong sense of individualism and personal liberty um, among its people. And we can trace that really to the First Great Awakening. It was a religious awakening, but Edwards was a philosopher, not just a theologian, and he was a political philosopher in some ways, um, much more so than Whitfield, Ed but Edwards was more significant than Winfield to the First Great Awakening and those and so aside from its religious spiritual connotations the effect that it had on people's understanding of personal salvation and thus personal liberty God saved me personally and he made me personally free and in making me free that entails certain personal rights that I have and remember I don't know how much you, I mean, I, I don't know how, I don't know your religious affiliations. Um, Jonathan Edwards was incredibly significant to John Piper. So if you've heard of Piper, you'll understand Piper is considered a Christian hedonist. In other words, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Finding joy in God, finding joy in God's creation, finding joy in the things that God has given us is what most glorifies him, right? Well, what does that sound like? So we have a right from God, and, it's, and it is expected of us, and God is glorified in us when we find joy in him and his creation and the things he, it, I mean, it's in God. We find joy in God. But the point is, what's extremely important about that is that we are joyful, right? God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That's a line from Piper, but it's taken directly from Edwards. What does that sound like? We are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, personal liberty, personal salvation from Edwards, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So two of those three things, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, can be directly traced, and that we are personally guaranteed those rights from our Creator can be personally traced to the First Great Awakening. Anyway, keep that in mind, because if there's a question about the build-up to the American Revolution, you're probably going to want to include that in your answer as well in the midterm. Um, so let's get to the French and Indian War, and now I didn't really expect to spend 20 minutes talking about these two things, so I'll try to keep this a little bit shorter than I intended. The French and Indian War obviously is part of, it's basically just the Amer American theater for uh, the Seven Years' War, which actually is nine years long, but anyway, um, I mean, ten, depending on how you look at it. Regardless, Seven Years' War, um, and between England and France, 
Um, Seven Years' War was part of a, was really part of the Hundred Years' War, a um, hundred years of conflict between the English and the French when they were just going at it left and right, as always the English won. The French never win unless they're with us. <laughs> but uh, anyways, um, it was just the American theater of that particular war. Um, so it wasn't its own war in and of itself. And obviously it's a fascinating name <laughs> for the war because the French, more, more Indians fought with the French. It was really the French and the Indians against the British. Um, um, which had some Indi Indians fighting, but anyway, regardless. The other one thing that is interesting about it is that, and this is significant um, towards the end result, is that the British that were fighting were 95% of them were, I mean, it was essentially just the colonists. Um, they sent in, the British sent some especially higher ranked um, people to help, but a lot of the fighting was done by colonists. Uh, almost all of the fighting was done by colonists because again, the, the, it was part of a war that was going on in Europe and you know, the British, had, they have a lot more colonists than the French did in uh, North America. And so to their minds, we have a manpower advantage there already. We're fighting this war you know, here actually in where the motherland is, you know, why are we going to send a bunch of troops there? You know, it's, it was an understandable strategy. It's, I don't think that the colonists had any room to complain about it or anything, and they, and they really didn't. Um, but it becomes significant later that it was pretty much all colonists, whereas the French struck a treaty with, uh, you know, a lot of the, Indi the, Amer the Native American tribes, um, that surrounded them and a lot of their soldiers were professional armies that they hired. They paid the Prussians or um, some Austro-Germans. You know, they just had a lot of professionals that came in and did the fighting for them. And then some of their some of their colonists too, but they had a lot less colonists than the British did by, an, by actually more than a two to one margin. Um, and so, um, and so they had to just, just to even out the numbers, they had to bring in Ad additional resources to help them in their fighting. So that would become significant because, um, again, if, if, if a lot of this, the huge conflict to the colonists is taking place and it's us, it's all us, we're winning this war. We're going to win this war, this aspect of the war for you, and we did. And so then what happened after the war became more significant because we felt like it was such a personal achievement. If the British had just sent in a huge army and you know the French are going to try to come in here and we're going to send this army to help you guys kick them out and we're you know we're in this together the, you know mother country king you know Europe and colonists and we're all in this together and we're, you know then things that happened after the war might have been seen in a completely different light um, but because we were the ones doing most of the fighting then the reaction to the war and what would happen after it was seen in a very negative light, um, understandably, for those reasons. Now again, the actual details of the war, like I said, Wikipedia, it's your best friend. Um, they're 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 really not that they're they're really not that significant um, to American history because again, while it was while it was significant in that it was colonists doing the fighting, the actual battles and what it would mean long term is significant to European history, not to American history. So how long the war took and the, the specifics of the battle, you'll, I mean, you'll go over them in Western Civ 1. Um, actually, no, you won't. You'll go over in Western Civ 2. Um, but for us, the details, like I said, if you need something to, if you, like if I say French and Indian War and you go, what? Never heard of it then you probably do need some context. Uh, my assumption is that you're not going to do that. And so my, my assumption is that you've at least heard enough and read enough that you understand the context, at least in a limited sense. Um, but if you don't, and if none of this makes sense because you don't even understand the context, then pause the video and go to Wikipedia and learn some of the basic context and then come back. Okay, we're back. Sweet. Hopefully none of you left. <laughs>
Um, there's essentially three things um, that are important if you're taking notes. There's three things, three key points of significance um, that we need to keep in mind as we look at um, the French and Indian War and as we consider the significance that the French and Indian War would have on American history. The first um, is, is that the result of it, which if you Wikipedia, you'll know the British won, um, the result of it is that it limited French involvement in the Americas. Um, which would, to American history, not be that important for the next 10 years, but when do you think it would be important? It would be important in the American Revolution. Imagine for a second if, say, it had been a, say it had been a neutral peace treaty. Say it had been something like King George's War, where basically they signed a peace treaty that said everything's going to be the same that it was before the war. Then in North America, you would still have, if you imagine the geography, you'd still have, you know, the British with control of kind of that middle, you know, that modern day northern uh, Georgia up to basically New York City, um, a little bit further north, um, and then down into, you know, Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, you know, into little bit parts of Ohio and stuff like that. And then you, to the Mississippi, really. And then you would have French kind of s scattered, not as centrally localized as that, but you would still have the French, you know, kind of to the west and move it south in uh, Louisiana, which was a huge section of land at the time, kind of scattered, but still they would, they would have control over that. And then obviously Canada, I mean, everyone, you know, and so if that had been what had happened, and then the American Revolution breaks out, what would be the French reaction? Probably to exert its own influence and to take advantage of the situation, no? I, I mean, I certainly think so. Um, and if that had happened, then we, we would have had a much, much different result. Um, whether they were predominantly fighting us, in which case we were doomed because there was no way we were fighting the French and the British, whether they fought us and the British and just tried to do their own thing. I mean, it would have been a completely different result, but because that's not what happened, because the British won and the peace treaty reflected that, and because the French influence over um, North America would become so limited then instead of the French making their own play, the French essentially just helped us. And there you go. Um, and, that f and, and the fact, as we'll see when we actually look at the American Revolution, and as I'm sure to some, in, in some sense you guys already know, that support from the French played a huge part um, in the fact that we were able to actually revolt successfully. Um, and so in that way, the French and the Indian War was was hugely significant to American history because without French support, we probably don't win the war, at least not in the same way that we do the American Revolutionary War, I mean, um, or certainly not in the same way that we did. Um, and, without, and, then, and without the French and Indian War, and without the British winning that, and without the peace treaty reflecting that, and without their influence becoming limited, uh, we don't get that French support. So there's, it can, you know, winning the Revolutionary War in the way that we did and as overwhelmingly as we did can be directly traced to the fact that the French lost the French and Indian War. Um, so that's one. The second thing is that it's, there, are, there were a lot of people who fought in the American, a lot of colonists who, if it had not been for the French and Indian War, would have been going into the American Revolutionary War with absolutely zero fighting experience, battle experience, fighting skill, whatever you want to call it. We would not have been in a battle, nobody from the colonies, if it hadn't been for the French and Indian War. Meanwhile, we would have been fighting this professional army from, um, from Great Britain who had been in the Seven Years War, and they, I mean, there were so many conflicts over there all the time. That would have there was already a big difference in the professionalism between the the, the colonists and the British. Um, the difference would have been 
exceptionally greater um, if it hadn't been for the French and Indian War. So when you see someone, I mean, there's was, there was Washington, Gates, Benedict Arnold. I mean, there's plenty of people who, who fought that and gained that experience. And so the most, the, the more, more famous um, example that's given when people talk about that, when they talk about the fact that the French and Indian War gave experience to colonists who would then fight in the American Revolutionary War, the most famous person people talk about is George Washington, uh, both because he was obviously our general and our command, commanding general, and also because he was the most significant player actually in the French and Indian War as well. Um, and, and when you think about it, you know, Washington wasn't like a brilliant, skilled tactician or something. I mean, he wasn't even, he, I don't know, maybe he won two battles or something he was ever in. Um, if you were ranking, you know, top 100 reasons why the United States won the Revolutionary War, Washington's skill in battle would probably be like 71st or something. Um, now, he was exceptionally significant in other ways, and actually, when we get into the Revolutionary War, we'll talk about one of the, one of those stories that somehow become lost to history, even though I think it's one of the most fascinating stories in all of American history. Um, but it had nothing to do with his skill in battle. His skill in battle wasn't the greatest thing in the world. But Washington was one of those guys who, um, he, two things. First, he understood the psychology of those who served under him. And two, he got better as he went along. Um, and those two reasons were both helped significantly by the French and Indian War, obviously, being in the war and seeing the psychology of the troops and seeing how men reacted to victory and defeat and hunger and not getting paid enough and, you know, all of these factors. He saw all that. And obviously that only helped him when it came to the American Revolutionary War. And then, um, secondly, he, he did, as a um, planning for battle and, and executing battle and responding to battle, he and having an overall strategy um, for how the war would be run um, and won. Um, he got a lot more cohesive as he went along and so as he got experience and obviously he saved himself about seven years worth of experience um, by having the French and Indian War instead of those first seven years being the first seven years of the Revolutionary War he was already on year eight when he started the Revolutionary War and that could only help. You know, there are people who are, people who are born um, to be in wars. Um, and, you, and we've seen that in American history. There's, you've got your Stonewall Jacksons, you've got your Benedict Arnolds, you've got your Robert E. Lees, you, you know, you've got these people that that's, that's just what they were born to do. Um, and then you've got your people who weren't and who are intelligent enough and humble enough to learn as they go and get a lot better at it. Um, and that's, you know, you, that, that's where you got your Sherman, you know, in the Civil War. You know, you've got your uh, Bill Patton or your, you know, guys like that. And Washington falls into that latter category. He was not, he was born to be a Virginian gentleman, you know. He wasn't born to be, or he was, I mean, if you prefer, he was born to survey land since he was so strong and athletic for the time. Um, he wasn't one of those guys who was a natural at fighting or at strategizing or anything like that. But he did get a lot better as he went along. Um, and so gaining that, those first couple years of experience in the French and Indian War would be significant. And so you see that in him and you see that in others. Um, Benedict Arnold, for crying out loud, who I would argue um, was, a more, was a more significant reason. His skill in battle and his skill at winning battles was a more significant reason for why we won the Revolutionary War than Washington. I'll just say that. Um, I know he was a traitor, by the way, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and so even he, you know, he actually volunteered for three different tours um, in the French and Indian War. Um, and the experience that he got there and how he reacted um, 
to being a part of that war and how that would help him later in the Revolutionary War as he won us all of our significant battles. Um, that would be instrumental, you know. Gacy, you know, there's plenty of stories like that. The point is, you know, in almost everything that we do, having experience at it is extremely important. And so in that way, instead of being completely unprepared for what would come our way during the Revolutionary War as we fought trained British troops, we at least had that foundation of experience, and it was because of the French and Indian War. So that's the second reason. By the way, if there's a question on the exam about the build-up to the Revolutionary War, spend a lot more time talking about the first point that I made about the French involvement in America than you do and talking about the experience that we got from the French and Indian War, because in my mind, that first reason is a lot more clear and a lot more defensible than the second reason. I really only threw this second reason about the experience in there because everyone else does. And so I felt like I'd be robbing you guys of something um, if I didn't include it. But I don't think it's that big of a deal. So mention it. If it's even a question on the midterm. Um, but don't spend, a, don't spend a lot of details or don't spend a lot of time talking about the details of what that would mean. The third and last reason, um, or the third and last um, point of significance about the French and Indian War is by far its most important. So are you ready to take notes? Just kidding, but seriously. Um, and that reason is that it doubled Great Britain's national debt by far the most significant aspect of the French and Indian War is that at the end of it, Great Britain now had a huge debt and a much bigger debt than they did before. Um, of course, it was probably like $5 million or something, which we would laugh at now, but um, I don't actually know that that's a figure. If you use that in an exam, I'll take points off. But the point is it was something which we would find to be extremely low. But at the time, it was astronomical. Um, and so how do you think they responded to that? Well, they responded to it by um, raising taxes on the colonists. Um, there was a discussion in Britain at the time as to whether, at, when they raised ta taxes on the colonists, whether that was a good time to allow the colonists to have representation in parliament. They decided against doing that. They decided to raise taxes, but they decided against allowing colonial representation in parliament. And whoever made that, whoever was eloquent enough in making that argument that it convinced everyone else to make that decision made one of the worst decisions in British history because obviously no taxation without representation would become the rallying cry of the revolution. And so because taxes would become... Now, addendum, real quick, before I get to that. We'll talk next week about how much was taxes actually the reason for the Revolutionary War? That's debatable. Um, because they were severely undertaxed in comparison to everyone else in the British Empire. Um, so how much was it actually the reason? Well, 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 we'll talk about that. But the point is, they said it was the reason. And it's how they got a lot of other people to believe it was the reason and to get fired up for that reason. Um, so in that way, it was the reason. And the reason why they had to raise taxes was because their debt was huge. They had to figure out some way to get it under control, and their decision was then to tax the colonists, but they still didn't allow, allow or to raise the taxes on the colonists to a significant amount um, in comparison to what it was before, and there was still no representation. I hope that was clear enough and simple enough because that was, if in 10 years someone asks you, hey, what was, what was so important about the French and Indian War? If you remember one thing, oh, the thing that was important about the French and Indian War is at the end of it, England owed everyone else a ton of money and to make that money, they taxed the colonists. And because they taxed the colonists, we revolted. Obviously, that's extremely significant. That's extremely simplistic. Um, and next week, we'll talk about the details of how that actually came to be. Next week is entitled "Double the Taxes, Triple the Taxes: The Build-Up to the American Revolution," which is a line from.
favorite Disney cartoon, Robin Hood, one of my favorites. Um, and so we'll talk a lot about what how that what that actually looked like. What it actually looked like for them to raise the taxes. How did we respond to them raising the taxes? What did England do in response to our response to them raising? You know, we'll talk about all of that. So this is simplistic, but the point is, if there's only two steps, it was huge debt, raise the taxes, revolution, and the changing of world history as a result. So that's our lecture for this week. Uh, make sure you do the reading um, on The Great Awakening. Um, and then there, obviously you'll, you should see, if you haven't seen it already, um, there's an assignment that will be due on Friday uh, based on this week's um, assignments. Or not assignments, there'll be assignment. There will be, a un I cannot talk right now. There will be one assignment based on the uh, to be turned in on Friday um, based on everything that we've learned from this week. But you'll see that. All right, I will see you guys next week.